Well, as they do that, let me piggyback on what Jason was saying about the groups in connection with the service. So when uh, this was probably six or eight months ago, something like that, less than a year ago, um, I discovered a cut of beef at Costco that was, uh, I think it was called a beef shoulder, and it was super cheap for large amounts of beef. How many of you guys are already excited? And so, so I thought, here's the thing. I'm done spending money on lunch and going out to eat. And so I bought six pounds of this beef shoulder, and I learned that I could put all the spices on it, grill it up, and, and I would make uh, what I call steaky bites. I sliced it into little steaky bites, medium rare. I put it in a big bag in the refrigerator, and I began to eat steaky bites for all meals, okay? Um, breakfast, I had a couple eggs, some steaky bites. Lunch, steaky bites. Dinner, if Karen was at work, I didn't have to do any work. I could just pull out my Steaky bites. And so that was an incredible thing. It actually saved me a lot of money. Um, but something happened. I went to the doctor, and I've always been um, uh, surprisingly healthy for how um, uh, short I am for my weight. And so uh, anyway, I went to the doctor, and for the first time ever, I had remarkably high blood pressure. I was like, well, that's kind of strange. Um, and it couldn't have anything to do with eating Steaky bites for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for two months. Uh, and, and so it turned out the answer to that was yes. And so, um, so here's, here's why I tell that story is that steaky bites, when eaten in the proper amount and with other foods, are surprisingly healthy. But when you only eat steaky bites, you're not getting everything that you need. And so, so this whole thing, this whole series in connection with the groups was all set up together to kind of work together. So I really want to encourage you to not just eat the steaky bites. Don't just, I mean, come on Sundays. I'm glad you're here. Invite friends. This is really going to be a powerful series. I think God's going to do amazing things in your life and in your family as a result. But also, I really want to encourage you to make that next step. And for a lot of you, I know that you've been coming on Sundays, and it's like you're kind of comfortable with this level of involvement, but something more is like uncomfortable. I really want to encourage you to do the uncomfortable thing and, and, and take that other step and balance this because what's going to happen in here is we're really looking at things from the 30,000 foot view. I want you to, I want to help you see what's in your life and, and help you see why you even want to change it. Because the truth is a lot of times we know what we should, we, what we should do, but we just don't care to do it. Right. And so we're going to work on that angle in here, but then sometimes we know we want change, but we don't have any idea how to bring it right? And so, so we're going to work on two different things. One thing will be here in service, and the other things will be in these groups. And, and the relationships that you'll build in that will be essential to help you actually move forward. So I want to really encourage you to take advantage of the full thing, eat a balanced diet for the next few weeks. And if you're just, this will be, if this is your first time getting involved in groups, I promise you're going to love it. You're going to feel like this church is your family in a whole new kind of way. So, so please do that. As we get started, uh, just so you know, the answer key here, we're going to be talking about David and Goliath for the next six weeks. And, and the funny thing about this story is it's probably one of the most iconic stories in the Bible, right? No matter where you go, people have probably heard this story. Uh, and even if you're not super familiar with it, you could go all over the world and almost anybody you meet, if you used the phrase, it was a real David and Goliath scenario, People are going to know what you mean, right? They know it's going to mean like victory against all odds, the little guy taking it home, that kind of thing. But in case you're not super familiar, I want to give you the quick version. So there was the country of Israel, and this story actually takes place about a thousand years before Jesus. So that's about 3,000 years ago from today. Okay, and so so about three thousand years ago, there was this country uh, called Israel, and they were actually a band of people who had been slaves in Egypt. God had delivered them from Egypt. They moved across the wilderness. God promised them this new land. They moved into the land, and they began to assume the land and take control of it against all kinds of crazy odds. And so that happened about three or four hundred years after that, when they moved into the land, as the story of David and Goliath. So now they've been in the land three or four hundred years, they've developed as a nation, they're organized, they're, they've got communities, they've got you know, regions and cities, and they've actually got their first king now. So they're an established nation, but there is this, this group of people called the Philistines who has lived in their land since they moved in, 
okay? And they've been like kind of uh, an enemy tribe that was on their own soil that they never got rid of when they moved in and took control. The Philistines, they've been fighting back and forth now for three or four hundred years, okay? So things have come to a boiling point at the story of David and Goliath. Saul is the king. He's got his troops assembled because the Philistines have assembled for war. They're on Jewish territory. They're in, in, Jewish, in, the, in, in, the, in the region of Judah. They're ready to fight. So Saul assembles his soldiers and they go down to face the Philistines. They get there and there is this guy who is nine feet tall. He's got, I mean, he is the biggest thing any of these guys have ever seen, all right? And, and you've probably looked at Guinness Book of World Records and seen there's been other people that size throughout time. And, and there was this kind of um, family line almost of giants that existed in this area at this time, and he was one of those guys. And so he was huge. Uh, and you can imagine in that age, in that time, violence was king, right? And so he was the man. And so he was a warrior. Everyone knew about him. He was iconic. Everyone knew Goliath. He had killed so many men. Everyone talked about, there was just stories about Goliath. So they line up for war. Goliath walks out. They're all terrified. Goliath says, hey, instead of all of us fighting, why don't you guys pick a guy? We'll pick a guy. I don't know maybe me, and we'll fight each other. Whoever wins, wins the whole war. So, so if, if your guy kills me, yeah, right, then, then we'll, all the Philistines will willingly be your slaves forever. And if I kill you, if I happen to win and kill your guy, then you guys will be our slaves. And so, so that's the deal he proposes. The Israelites are sitting there terrified because who wants to go fight this guy? Not only is he huge, but he's been killing people since he was a kid for fun, right? And, and so, so they're all looking around, I ain't going to do it. And so every day, this is going on for 40 days, the Bible says. He comes out twice a day in the morning and in the evening, shouts insults, proposes the challenge, and waits. And nobody steps up. So King Saul is saying, listen, we got to do something, guys. We got to get a guy. And so he's, he's, okay, the guy who fights Goliath and wins never pays taxes again. No one volunteers, right? How many of you guys are like, I'd already be there? And so, and then, and then the next one's like, he goes, okay, that didn't work. So whoever fights Goliath and wins, not only does he not pay taxes forever, but he gets to marry my daughter, right? You can't raise your hand if you want to do that. You'll be in trouble. And so anyway, um, and so there's, that's going on and on. He's offering all this stuff. Nobody steps up because they're like, no, it's a death sentence. So in walks this kid, David. He's probably uh, uh, either a young adult or an older teenager at this time. He's been watching his family's sheep. He's the shepherd. His brothers are older. They're in the army. Dad says, take some food to your brothers. So he brings some food. It actually says he brought cheese. I don't know why that detail was important for you to know, but the Bible said it, so I'm telling you. So he brings some cheese for his brothers who are at battle. He shows up there. He's handing out the cheese, and, uh, and all of a sudden he hears this guy walk out and start screaming stuff at his brothers and at the rest of the soldiers. Same drill, same stuff, and David's looking around. Well, who's going to go fight? Like, are you crazy? He goes, oh, come on, guys. Someone's got to go fight this guy. And, and David eventually says, well, if you guys won't, I'll go do it. And they say, shut up. You can't do that. This guy's been killing people for fun. I mean, this is just like a Tuesday for him. You can't go kill this guy. And David says something interesting. He goes, no, I don't think I can kill him. But check this out. I've been a, I've been a shepherd for all these years. And, and two different times this happened. One time a bear attacked my sheep. And I wasn't trying to be a hero. I went and grabbed the sheep and was pulling it away from the bear, and the bear turned on me. So I grabbed it by its hair, and I just hit it. So I struck it, right? And it died. And he said, and then another time, a lion attacked our sheep. And, and, and I grabbed it and seized it by the hair. That was his system, right? Grab it by the hair. He must have had sisters. And so grabbed it by the hair. And he struck it, and he killed it. And he goes, listen, that doesn't make any sense, but it happened. And so God evidently delivered the lion and the bear into my hand, and this Philistine is not going to be any different. I wasn't able to do that, but I did it. And I'm not able to do this, but I'll do this too. 
And they go, okay, <laughs> he's the first one to volunteer. And so then he asks, what's going to be done for the guy that does it, by the way? And they tell him, he's like, oh, bonus. I was just going to do it for fun. And so he goes out, and he's got a sling, because this is what he uses as, as a shepherd. You know, he, and slings don't look like this back then. They were just two long leather straps with a pouch in the middle. You put a stone in it, and you start to sling it, and you get it spinning as fast. And these guys got so good with this, and you'd let go of one of the straps, and that thing would hurl off at hundreds of miles an hour. And that's how they scared off animals. And so, so he's got his sling. He's like, I'm just going to do my thing. He goes out there, Goliath is infuriated, I'm going to tear you apart, I'm going to feed you to the birds, I'm going to, all this stuff. And he goes, oh, okay, well, let's see. And so, you know, Goliath starts charging at him, he grabs his thing, he starts spinning it, lets it go, and one single rock flies at hundreds of miles an hour, hits him right between the eyes, and he's dead before he hits the ground. And suddenly, all the Israelites go, huh, it's not all that impossible. David wants to make sure nobody thinks it's, it's not over yet, so he pulls Goliath's own sword out, and he takes his head off with his own sword just to show everybody it's not that hard. So the, 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 the Jews now realize, hey, God is with us. He's fighting for us. They take off running, and they just decimate the Philistines. They're chasing them down, killing off their enemies, and that is the story of David and Goliath and how his victory brought on by God was able to bring victory, not just for him, but for all the Israelites. And so we're going to be chewing this apart and kind of working on bits and pieces of this for the next few weeks. But today I want to talk about the very beginning, all right? Because 400 years before this story, we talked about the Israelites coming out of Egyptian slavery as free people. And God led them to Canaan, and he commanded them to defeat and drive out the people who lived there. And basically, they did that. I have a picture of this up here on the wall, uh, this map here. Um, so basically, they did that, but not all the way. So if you look, I have this cool laser pointer here that doesn't work all the time. Um, so this orange area right here, that's all the spot that at this time where Saul was king that they possess. Israel possesses all that. All these cities, these are all Israelite cities, okay? So all of that is the area they own and they run. This area over here that says Philistia, this is where the Philistines are living. Now, when they moved in from Egypt, when they came in, took possession of the land, they were supposed to drive out everybody, get rid of everybody, and clean the slate. They didn't necessarily do that. When they first moved in, though, the Philistines were only living right over here in this area. There's some mountains. Uh, there you go. Uh, See the dot for a second. Um, they were just over here. There were some mountains just before the coast, and they were just like some crazy mountain people living up on the coast and in the mountains. They weren't a threat. They weren't anybody serious. And then over the course of hundreds of years, while they settled the rest of the land, the Philistine threat slowly grew. They became more and more numerous, more and more numerous, more and more powerful, until this day where Saul is king, and you can see... They're kind of like their own country now. They have seven cities, right? They're, they're, they've moved far away from the coast. And this city right here, Soko, is where all the action today is happening. And that's firmly in Jewish territory. That is a Jewish area, but they now have an established city within Jewish area. And so that's kind of the setting here. And so, so what happened is when they moved in, they got down all the way to the region in the south here that's Judah, and they kind of said, ah, these guys, we'll take care of them later. They didn't finish the job. They didn't drive them out. They didn't take complete control. And that's the source of all the problems that they're now having. Just because the Philistines weren't a big bother to them right then, they let them be. And now a few generations pass, and a few more generations pass, and it's gotten bigger, and it's gotten bigger, and it's swallowing up more and more of their own territory, and it's becoming a real threat. And so at this point of the story of David and Goliath, it's clear now that these two growing nations cannot coexist. Someone has to take control. And so, so it's actually the Philistines that made the first move. The Jews weren't even taking responsibility. The Philistines came to battle. They set up camp, and then once they did, the Jews began to respond. 
And so that's, that's the setting, right? And so the Philistines make their stand, and there's actually this large hill. Oh, it's still working. There's this large hill over here and a large hill over here, and there's a valley in between. You have the Philistines on one hill. You have the Jews on the other hill and their battle camps. And this big valley in the middle is called the Valley of Allah. And that's going to be the site of the battle. And so that's the setting. That's what's going on. And I want you to see a couple of things really quickly. This area that's called Philistia, right, with these cities, is that smaller or is that bigger than this big orange area that's called Israel? It's smaller. In fact, it's about a fifth of the amount of land. So you have you have the Israelites that possess five times as much territory as the Philistines. Now let's look at the cities. How many cities do you see over here? There's seven of them. How many cities are over here? There's over 30. So if you had to just take a guess, I know you guys aren't military strategists. Who do you think has the advantage in this fight? The Jews, right? The Jews have the clear advantage. The Israelites have the advantage. The Philistines definitely have the underhand in this event. The Jews, if they took this threat seriously, right, if, if they unified and they did, they had one unified government. The Philistines, that wasn't even a country. That was just a band of tribal people, and they were loyal to their own cities. So it wasn't even a unified government with one army. It was just warriors from all of these Philistine cities. So in every way, the Jews have the advantage. The Israelites have the advantage. So if Israel had taken the threat of the Philistines seriously, united all their strength to deal with the problem once and for all, they would have won rather quickly. All right. Now we're going to read the account of the story here in 1 Samuel 17. The Philistines assembled their troops for war at Soko of Judah. It says it that way on purpose. It says Soko of Judah. Soko is the name of a Philistine city, but it's in where? Judah, right? Do you see the problem already? There are Philistine cities in Israeli territories, okay? So they're assembling at Soko of Judah. They've given away a city in their own land to the Philistines. They have the enemy living among them. So it goes on. They camped between Soko and Ezekah at Ephes Damim. And Saul and the Israelite army assembled and camped in Allah Valley, where they got organized to fight the Philistines. The Philistines took up positions on one hill, while Israel took up positions on the opposite hill. There was a valley between them. A champion named Goliath from Gath. Again, it's the city. That's where he was from. There wasn't a unified country. The champion Goliath from Gath came out from the Philistine camp. He was more than nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head. He wore bronze scale armor weighing 125 pounds. He had bronze plates on his shins and bronze skimpter hung on his back. His spear shaft was as strong as the bar on a weaver's loom. So that means it was about, just the shaft of the spear was about two and a half inches in diameter. That's a big spear. All right, we're moving on. Um, tuna, uh, weaver's loom, and its iron head weighed 15 pounds. His shield bearer walked in front of him. So it's painting a picture. First of all, he's huge and he's strong. Does anybody in here weigh 125 pounds roughly? Uh, all right, so what we're going to do is you just come and jump. I'm like, no, I'm just kidding. And so imagine if you're so big that, that your, your military shirt weighs 125 pounds, and you just wear it. Like, oh, that's fine. All right. And then you're so strong that you can hold a spear that's like 10 feet long, and the, sha the point on the end weighs 15 pounds, and you can throw it and hit stuff. Right? Imagine being that strong. And then he's got all this armor. His legs are armored. His head is armored. His chest is armored. Everything's armored. And he's even got another guy walking in front of him that's carrying a big, huge shield just to block anything else that might get by. So if you're looking at that, not only is he huge and strong and he can kill you, but I can't even hit him, right? So this looks like an impossible scenario. 
he stopped and he shouted to the Israelite troops, why have you come and taken up battle formations? I'm a Philistine champion. You're Saul's servants. Isn't that right? Select one of your men and let him come down against me. If he is able to fight me and kill me, then I'll become, we will become your slaves. But if I overcome him and kill him, then you will become our slaves and you will serve us. I insult Israel's troops today. All right. The Philistine continued, Give me an opponent and we will fight. And when Saul and all Israel heard what the Philistines said, they were distressed and terrified. If you read on a few verses later, it says that he did that same thing every day, twice a day, for 40 days. And so here's the first point, guys. Israel was supposed to destroy and drive out the enemy, but the enemy is proposing terms for a compromise. Their enemy is saying, hey, listen, we don't have to just destroy each other. Let's work this out. We can coexist. We just have to make some arrangements. Now, there's two reasons God instructed them when they went into the land a few hundred years earlier. He said, do not make any deals with the inhabitants. They either die or you force them out, but they cannot stay and you cannot make any arrangements. And that sounds harsh, but there was two reasons. And the first is that if the people remained, God knew Israel would be constantly corrupted by their influence. That it would constantly be a cycle of rather than, than the, the people who were already there adopting Israel's way of life, Israel would adopt their way of life. And over and over again, that happened constantly. Israel would adopt the sinful practices of its neighbors and the inhabitants rather than influence working the other way around. How many of you guys have ever seen that in your own life? Right? Isn't that weird how that happens? And, and there's a simple reason I just kind of made up a law. Uh, it's called the, the law of influence gravity. All right, so if this is a law I just decided. Anyway, uh, downward influence can be effortless, but influencing up requires deliberate focus. That's why that happens. For you to be negatively influenced doesn't take any effort. How many of you guys know you don't have to try to fall down, right? It doesn't take any effort. If I walk and keep walking, I'm going to fall down. But if I come this way and I walk towards this to go up, it's not just going to happen. I'm going to have to exert effort. I'm going to have to, how many of you guys were here last week when Chris, uh, he won, he jumped up, he almost didn't make it. I thought he was going to lose teeth. But anyway, and so, oh, it was so fun. If you missed it, go watch the video. So anyway, that, but, but it takes effort to go up. But you can go down rather easily. And that's just how life is. The other reason God said don't allow them to remain is because whatever is allowed to remain does not stay confined to where you leave it. How many of you guys have children? You've learned this. If you say stay here, they always stay there, right? If you tell a kid in a store, stay right here, Within five seconds, they're going to be everywhere but here, right? And that's just how life is. And the Philistines, they were becoming a problem because they were not staying up in the hill region where they originally were when Israel didn't care about them. They were spreading out. They were taking on more and more area. And here's a simple point I want to make is that when we have habits and tendencies and emotional hang-ups, maybe right now, they don't control major parts of our lives. Or maybe they didn't when they started, right? But if they remain in our lives over time, they will grow and have more and more impact in our lives. So fear and anxiety may only be a small issue for you now. It may only be an occasional thing now. Or that kind of sketchy use, the way that you're using alcohol to kind of get by or, 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 or get going or calm down or whatever it is. Or, or if it's those pills that you're taking too many of or you're taking pills that aren't even prescribed to you or whatever it is. If it's that, if it's, if it's you know, kind of you do a little bit, a little smoke smoke to kind of take the edge off. And it's, it's okay because it's, it's helping me. It's helping me cope. It's what I need to get by. See, listen. Those things, they will not stay in their place. And if you say, hey, I just need this to take the edge off. I just need this to kind of chill out a little bit. You don't understand. 
And that's great. But if, if it starts here, within a few years, it's going to be here. And then it's going to be here. And then it's going to be here. And then you're going to hand it off to your kids. And they're going to hand it off to their friends. And it's going to go on. And it's going to go on. It will not stay. And it, and it won't even stay with the original thing that you meant it to be. It's going to expand into other items and other problems for you. It's going to grow. And that's what the Philistines did. They started off in this area that was inconsequential. But over time, it takes on more and more real estate. And so within three or four hundred years, these guys who were nothing but crazy hillbillies that nobody ever saw and nobody cared about, now they have cities in Israelite territories. And so maybe you're here today and you say, man, my life is mostly under control and it's mostly positive, but there's that one thing that you don't really like to talk about. Maybe like the Israelites, most of the country for you is under control. But there's that one area where enemies linger. And maybe it's even like this situation. Maybe you know you have a giant. And you've got this thing that you know, I try not to get that thing going because when it goes, it goes. And maybe for you, it's your temper. And so everyone around you knows, well, just don't talk to them on a Monday, Tuesday, any day ending in A-Y, and you'll be fine, Right? Because they've got this giant and you can't awaken it or there will be trouble. And so I want to bring that picture back again. Here's the question. If Israel moved in, and if you know the stories, I won't have time to tell you all, but there were cities everywhere in this orange. There was walled cities and there were giants all over the place. And they moved in and they cleared all of this. Wouldn't it have made sense while they were clearing all of this to just go ahead and clear this as well? Wouldn't that have made sense when you're already moving, you already got your fighting clothes on, you already smell bad? Go ahead and finish the job, right? That would have made sense. But what if we're not all that different from Israel? What if we have little areas of our lives, we've got it mostly under control, but what if we have these little areas where enemies to us are still imposing their will on us? You see, in the three or four hundred years following the conquering of the land, what was just a small, inconsequential band of mountain people has turned into a real threat. And so the next point I want to make is pretty simple, and you know this. The longer issues remain, the harder they are to root out. It's just simple facts of life. But yet we think about it in total. If we, any of us, if I asked you that, you would say absolutely. But we think and, and act very differently, don't we? Sometimes we think one way and we act another way. So we know the longer it's there, the harder it is to get out. But we act a different way. We go, well, I'll get it tomorrow. <laughs> I'll, I'll take care of that later. I'm busy right now. Life is kind of crazy right now. I don't want to focus on it right now. I don't want to think about it right now. But we know in reality that every day that exists in our life, it puts down more and deeper roots, right? And so generations earlier when the Jews settled the land, I'm sure they planned to come back and finish getting rid of the Philistines. But here's the thing. They're thinking, you know what? It's getting cold. Winter is coming. And I think in that area, that means it's like 68, right? And so it's getting cold. Winter is coming. I got to get home and plant. That was a funny joke, and you guys didn't even laugh. I don't, I don't appreciate that. So anyway, it's getting cold. Winter's coming. I got to plant some seeds. I got to make sure there's a harvest in the spring. Plus, that's just so drastic. There's no need to be so drastic about it. But then the next season comes, and it's time to go out and fight. And they, well, I, I just got engaged. There's a wedding to plan. And then there's a honeymoon. And then there's a baby on the way. And then they're raising kids, and they just never, ever got back out there to deal with those Philistines. How many of you guys have been there? There's that issue in your life that you thought a long time ago, you know, this is not going to be there then. Right? And you, you didn't picture yourself as a full-grown adult with this thing still in your life. You didn't. You thought by then we'll take care of it, right? But then life 
it happens, right? And that's what happens to ourselves. We tell ourselves that, that we're going to get serious later. We're going to do whatever it takes and finally get serious and buckle down and take care of this. But life is going on and we're busy and it just doesn't need to be so drastic. And so over time, we just get used to that thing being there. And listen, the, the Israelites would not have gone to fight the Philistines if the Philistines hadn't lined up for battle. They were just letting them stay there. They were letting them expand. They were letting them start new cities in their own land. And so we get used to it being there. Those, those, those people around us even accept it as part of who we are, and they begin to work around it too. And we get to where it's normal to have enemies multiplying within our own borders. Fear and anger and compulsive behaviors or addictions or, you know, all these things, they're multiplying and they're taking up more and more territory. And once we start accepting these things in our lives that hurt us, we also start developing strategies for compartmentalizing, don't we? That's what we do. Right? We say, well, it's okay as long as my parents don't know. Right? Everything's going to be good. And that doesn't stop. How many of you guys are adults? That doesn't stop when you become an adult. Right? It's still okay as long as my parents don't know because I don't want to have that conversation. It's okay as long as my wife doesn't find out. It's okay as long as my husband doesn't find out. I mean, it's really normal as long as the boss doesn't know. Everybody's actually doing it, but we just can't tell the boss about it because he's got to be a boss, you know, and, and he doesn't want us, you know, doing that. Or we can do this as long as the kids don't see it, as long as the kids don't know what it is. Then, then, then we have a problem, but, but as long as it's not affecting them, so if we can keep it away from them, then we're okay to do it. Or maybe just as long as my church friends don't know. Or just not certain church friends, right? There's some church friends that we're okay with knowing. But when I was um, young, and I'm going to get myself in trouble here because my mother-in-law is here, but uh, a couple years ago, well, more than a couple years ago, when my son was born, uh, we bought a new house in the city. Well, it wasn't a new house, but it was new to us. It was 100 and something years old to everyone else. But anyway, um, and so we bought a house in the city. And if you know much about South, uh, South St. Louis, you can have really nice streets, and then you can walk about eight feet, and you can have a really bad street, okay? And so, so our house was really nice. It was very nice. Um, and, and, but here's the problem is that all the other streets around weren't very nice. And so, um, and so that's how you get a good deal on a house. You just make sure that house is nice and everything else is, is sketchy. And so anyway, so that's what we did because I was young and I was in ministry. I didn't make much money. So this was a nice house for us. But here's the problem. I really wanted my wife's family to be pumped about where her house was going to be. So we figured out a thing. If you get off at the first exit and you turn left, you drive past the park. And you go, whoa, you live by the park? Man, oh yeah, this is a super great neighborhood. Man, you, we can play tennis, we can go fishing, the kids could play in the park, you know, until like an hour before dark. And then we can do all of that, and then we go home, right? And as long as you take the first exit and you go through the park, it looks like I lived in a really nice neighborhood. But that's actually the longer way home. And the way that we always went when no one in the family besides us was with us is the second exit. And if you get off at the second exit, there were prostitutes, there were people selling drugs on corners, and that was actually only like a street away. And so we just had to always be sure which way we were going, depending on who was following us or in the car with us. And, and, and I think that's the first time that's ever been told publicly. And so anyway, uh, so I'm gonna, I'll have to explain that away later. But... You get the point? And here's the thing. If you have to carefully frame what parts of your life get shared with what people and in what angle and at what time and all of that stuff, it's impossibly, it's entirely possible that you have enemies multiplying within your borders. If you've got to make sure that they hear it a certain way so that they really understand it, you might have enemies multiplying within your borders. If you have to make sure that only certain people know about this at certain times, you've got enemies multiplying 
within your borders. And you might have a nuisance that's growing into a threat. You may not even consider it a giant right now. That's part of the thing. Well, it's not that big of a deal. Can I tell you something? Goliath was not born nine feet tall. He was born as a baby. And he grew. And he grew. And he grew. And so the problem with allowing enemies to grow is that giants are demoralizing. You see, when Israel showed up for battle, they should have been confident. I showed you the map. They had the advantage, right? But here's what would happen. They would line up in camp. They would do all their chest bumps. and <laughs> Everywhere we go, every, people want to know who we are. Who, so we tell. I mean, they would do all that in camp, man. They're like clacking and you know doing all that kind of stuff. And then they would get out to the battle line and they would see it. And they would hear every step. Boom. And they would hear his voice. And his voice, it, it sounded like a pack of bears eating, running Harley Davidsons, right? And, and it, was just, it just sounded insane. And they're like, ah! and all of the, who we are, it's all forgotten, right? And they're just silent. And every man's heart turned to wax and his knees to jello. Because how could anyone beat him? He's a giant. You see, by the time an issue grows to giant status in your life, you have given into it and you've been defeated by it so many times that you look at it the way those soldiers looked at Goliath. How many times have you done it, right? When it's not happening, you psyched up, man. You had your morning prayer. You're doing, like, that's it. Man, everything's going to be different. And then that thing calls your name. And you crumble again. And you're looking at it just like those soldiers at Goliath. And you say, who can beat this? Who can change this? And so maybe you've tried and you've failed at this thing so many times that you think, it's impossible. And that's how those soldiers felt. And I don't want to leave you discouraged because the, the truth is, we're going to talk about this in coming weeks. If you could beat it yourself, you wouldn't. But the answer is not you. And we'll talk about that more later. So move on. So here's a question. How do we know when we have a giant? How do we know when this issue is a giant? So the first question we have to answer is, what's a giant? How many of you guys grew up in church ever since church has been invented, right? And so if you grew up and you're from a special kind of church, they would say a giant is a stronghold. How many of you guys know what I mean when I say a stronghold? How many of you guys hear that? And that sounds like a church word, but I have no idea what it really means, right? A stronghold is like a military place that was hardened. It would be like you'd have mountains at your back, mountains on your side, and one little entrance in that you can defend. That's a stronghold. Right? And if, if an army gets into a stronghold, you cannot take them out. And so that's what that means in your life, is you've got this thing that's so hardened in, it's so protected in your life that you can't work it out. So if you have that background, then a giant is a stronghold. If you don't have that background, it's, it's a habit. It's an addiction. It's a pattern. It's something that we've just come to see as part of who we are. And maybe you actually started off in the driver's seat a long time ago. How many of you guys have a habit that a long, long time ago was something fun that you decided to do, right? And then as time goes by, you're not calling the shots anymore. Suddenly you find yourself and you go, whoa, where did we, when did we start doing this? I didn't even realize this was happening, right? And then eventually it's not even fun anymore and it just demoralizes you. And so that's what happens. We no longer even necessarily initiate it. And that is when you have a giant. And I want you to know, we don't have to like be so like shameful because anything can be a giant. Maybe you're here and your giant is some, some medications that you just can't kick and you're, you're misusing. But, but it can be anything. 
It's not just drugs, and it's not just alcohol that's misused. It's not just that stuff. A giant can be anything. You know, comfort and complacency for many of us is a giant. We won't do anything that's not easy. We won't do anything that we haven't done a million times. And so we're stuck. There's opportunities all around us. God wants to give us so much, but it requires something of us that we haven't done before. So comfort and complacency can be a giant. Fear and anxiety can be a giant. For many of us, binge eating might be a giant, right? And we just, you know, we, we, we can control one thing. We can, no, we can eat ourselves happy. We can eat ourselves not sad. We can eat ourselves to sleep at night. You know, I figured that out a while ago. I learned this from someone else who, thanks for passing on the, the, the challenge to me. You know, if you eat a big bowl of cereal right before bed, you can go, oh, I learned that. And you know what? You can also get, get really chubby. And so anyway, I, I, I learned this stuff, man. I could eat myself to sleep. I could eat myself happy. And so for many of us, that's a giant. Alcoholism can be a giant. Well, you don't understand. I just I'm stressed out all the time. Or I just, I just got to relax. I just got to, you know, I just got to do, I just got to, I just got to, I just got to. For some of us, it's out of control anger. Everything makes us angry. Everything. For some of us, it's materialism. We just got to have things a certain way. We got to have this, got to have that. We're spending for pleasure, not for need. Listen, if spending is a pleasure for you, that's, that's a problem. It's not supposed to be a, a pleasure. It's supposed to be something you do to fulfill a need. I need this, so I go buy this. Not I need this, so I go buy this. So we go on and on. I mean, the list of giants is endless, so we don't have time to say everybody's giant. But we start off with us using these things. But somewhere along the way, the leash gets turned around and now the dog is walking us. And that is when you have a giant. There's an old saying, I've said it before, I'll say it a million times again. I don't know who said it, but it's this. Sin will take you further than you wanted to go. It'll keep you longer than you wanted to stay. And it will cost you more than you're willing to pay. That's a giant. Romans 6, 15 and 16 describes it like this. It says, shall we sin then because we're not under the law? But in other words, because Jesus forgives us, should we just go ahead and not worry about it and sin? Because that's great. Here's the thing. There's no condemnation in Jesus Christ. So if you're a believer in Jesus, all that we're talking about today, it, it can hurt you, but not for eternity because Jesus has forgiven you. And you're going to spend an eternity in heaven with him. And so you know the end of the story. So sometimes we go, well, it's okay because I'm going to go to heaven anyway. So it doesn't really matter if I continue to do this. But Paul answers that question here. He says, shall we sin then because we're not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Right? Modern translation, what are you talking about? Right? That line of thinking, he says, doesn't make sense. And here's why. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves... You are slaves to the one you are obey. That seems obvious, but you say, listen, if you go up to Carrie and you say, Carrie, I want to be your slave. She's going to say, okay, here's some laundry. Here's this, here's that. Party time. And then when about an hour or two later, when it's no longer novel and you go, hey, guess what? That's not fun anymore. Don't so much want to do it. She's going to say, too bad. You're my slave. Go pick up the dog poop, right? I mean, just whatever it is. And you're, you don't want to play anymore, but you've given yourself up. And that's what we do. When we, we go, well, it doesn't matter if I sin because Jesus is going to forgive me. You're offering yourself to this thing as a slave. And right now it might be fun and interesting and novel, but in a minute, it's not going to be. And so he says, don't you know that when you offer yourself to someone as an obedient slave, you are slaves to the one you obey. Whether that's slaves to sin which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. So here's the thing as we kind of wrap this thing around. Goliath is now dictating the terms of life to the Israelites on their own land. He's telling them how it's going to go. Even though Israel has the military advantage, Goliath is setting the terms for them. He's saying, listen, here's what we're going to do. Here's how it's going to work. Here's what's going to be. And it doesn't make any sense. And so the question is, why are they considering this? 
Well, first of all, their fear has caused them to believe that Goliath is in control of this exchange. Just like you, you've lost to this thing so many times that you believe that it is in control. Even though Jesus actually defeated that thing a couple thousand years ago on the cross and set you free, you believe it's in control. So you're allowing it to dictate life to you. But there's this other reason. Maybe the prospect of what slave labor could do for them has them curious because the command from God was just to go out and attack. So they actually did them a favor. They assembled. So the Israelites, if they were obeying what God said, they would go out and attack them because it's easier. They're all in one place right now. They can do what God said. But instead they say, oh, wait a second. What about not destroying the Philistines? What if we keep them around and we just kill one and then we get to keep the rest of them as slaves? What could we accomplish if we had all these strong guys here serving us as slaves. I know, I know it's not what God said. I know it's not what we were told to do. But think of all the benefits. And how often do we fall for allowing things to remain in our lives because we think, if I can just keep this under control, it'll serve a purpose. I know it's not really how it should be. No, it's not really God's plan. No, it's not technically right or legal, whatever it is. But if I, can, if I can have this, it's going to serve a purpose. If I can make this giant, my servant, think of the fun or the comfort or the pleasure or just the ability that I'll have to numb the pain, it will work if I can keep it tame. If I can make it serve me. He hasn't figured out yet. You can't tame it. It will not be tame. It will not serve you. So for whatever reason, though, this one man who's part of the minority clan here is dictating to God's people what should be done on their own land. And so I want to just make this really clear, guys. When our issues begin to reorder our lives, we have a giant. When your life begins to be molded around that thing, you have a giant. When people in your life confront that issue and you let those people go, rather than dealing with that issue, you have a giant. When you begin mentally planning your day around getting one more of those, getting one more pill, getting one more drink, getting one more opportunity to do this. If so-and-so is coming over at such and such time, so i got to do it now before they get here because they'll see it, they'll know. You have a giant. When, you, when, when fear or anger begin to dictate how you act or, or what you will or will not do or who you will or will not be around, you have a giant. When you're planning how to sneak things that you bought into your house and into your life without tipping off your spouse, you have a giant. When you won't do anything new or worthwhile because you're just comfortable how you are, you have a giant. Do you see how that works? Do you see how that giant is reordering your life? How that giant is this little thing in your life, but it's calling the shots. It's dictating the terms for you, for your whole life, on your own territory that God has given you to rule and be free in. You see, anytime you have one area that should be this simple little area of life, but it's seeming to have all these ripple effects into every other area of life, it's quite possible that you have a giant that's beginning to throw his weight around. And so I know some of you are right where because you're right like me. This is just how we are. Some of us are asking, I mean, is this really a giant or is this just a nuisance? How many of you guys have already thought that? I mean, it's not technically a giant yet, right? Hebrews 12.1 says this, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out. It's saying God has this incredible journey marked out for you, and there's all these things that are hanging on you as weights that are slowing you down, and they're tripping up your legs. And he's saying, you know what you should do? Whether it's a giant or not, you should just take all that stuff off and put it down so that you can run the race that's been marked out for you. So if we're asking, is this actually a giant? 
it probably shows us that we actually have the wrong intention from the beginning. So if you're asking, is this really a giant? What you're really asking is, is this bad enough yet that I need to take care of it now? That's what you're asking. But listen, all nuisances, if left to grow, grow into giants. And the longer they grow, the harder it is to kill them. So if we're wondering if blank thing actually qualifies as a giant, then we should just go ahead and set our sights on allowing Jesus to take that thing from us. Because it's slowing us down, it's weighing us down, it's tripping us up, and it's keeping us from running the race that he marked out. So the last quick thought, and I'm going to invite Colton to come and play something for us, but God has set you free. Do not accept anything less for your life. I'm going to say that a couple times. I want you to just look and really hear that. God has set you free. What Jesus did 2,000 years ago was to free you. Don't accept anything less for your life. God has set you free. Don't accept anything less for your life. You see, when God freed the Israelites from Egyptian slavery, he decimated Egypt. He led them through the wilderness and into a land that was filled with giants and fortified cities. He empowered them to win impossible victories and achieve a power that was legendary, right? I mean, when they moved into the promised land, they started doing things that nobody had ever heard of. Everywhere they went, the fame of the victories of the God of Israel, it went ahead of them. Everyone knew about this band of slaves who had toppled the greatest empire of their age, Egypt, and then they wiped out fortified cities like Jericho without ever swinging a sword. They defeated armies hundreds of times their size. Gideon led 300 men to kill over 100,000 soldiers, right? I mean, they were doing things that nobody dreamed possible. That was their legacy. That's how God set them up. That's what God led them into. They walked right into a land after defeating all these people that had already been built up. A land that had been made rich and beautiful by the people who had lived there and God gave it to them as a gift. They harvested fields they didn't even plant. They occupied homes and cities they didn't even build. Imagine that generation going from a life of complete slavery in Egypt into a life of such freedom and blessing and just walking right into it. And that's what God did for them. And that's what he did for you through Jesus on the cross. But generations have passed now. There's been conflict and oppression and the Philistines are growing larger, more influential. The enemy is becoming a real threat. And here they are today on a field of decision, staring at a giant. Would they rediscover a life of freedom? Would they go back to how God set it up a couple hundred years earlier when they took the land? Would they go back to freedom? Would they go back to blessing? How they respond to this giant will determine the answer to that question. Slavery and destruction are freedom and blessing. The choice is bound up in their response to Goliath. And the same is true for us. Will you go on this journey? Will you let God make clear to you what the giants are in your life? Will you recognize the things that are mocking you and demoralizing you? the things that are keeping you from the life of freedom and blessing or the things that are just keeping you from the race God really built you to run, the impact he designed you to have. So I want to really encourage you to join a group, walk through this whole thing with us. Figure out what it looks like to invite Jesus up to the battle line to be your David. That's the coolest part of this story. We're not David. Jesus is David. He's the one that takes the enemy down. He's the one that cuts the head off the enemy and the giant in your life. Will you invite him to bring your giant to the ground? And as we go through this, this isn't going to be another one of those pep talks that you've gotten throughout your life. Come on, you can do it. Just try harder. Just do a little better. Just get back on that horse. You can do it. No, you can't. But he can, and he has. 
Jesus will be your David. He will be the hero in your story. He will set you free. You just have to allow him into the story. And you have to invite him onto the battlefield and then follow his lead. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you guys all at the same time to do this because I don't want anybody to feel funny. All right? And so on the seats in front of you, there's just lots of different kinds of paper. There's offering envelopes. There's connection cards. So what I want you to do is just reach out, grab one of those, and grab a pen. And we'll all just do it. And then here's what we're going to do. Probably as we were talking, some of you guys, it's already clear. You knew before you walked in, you saw the name of the series, you go, great. I'm going to have to stop doing blank. How many of you guys, that was you? You knew already. But some of you, as we were talking, God has really made it clear to you that there are some giants living. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to first understand that if you're in Jesus, none of that condemns you. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. You're right with God because of what Jesus did, not because of what you can do. And so there's freedom. So when you write that, there's no shame. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a minute and write down the name of your Goliath. And some of you guys are like, man, I need to go get like a whole pack of paper. Or whatever it is. Man, as God shows you some Goliaths, write them down. Don't write your name on it because uh, I'm just going to have you guys leave them on those uh, little ledges as you leave. And then I'm going to collect them all. And I'm not going to let anybody see them. I'm just going to be praying for all you guys. I won't know your name. I won't know your, you know, what issue is connected to you. But I want you to just write down the name of your giant. And I'm not asking you to write down something you're going to work harder on. What you're doing is you're writing down Jesus' battle assignment. You've just hired a hitman. As you write that down, like, go take him out, Jesus. I've been carrying this for too long. I've been dealing with this for too long. And I want to be free. I want to run the race that you've marked out for me. I want to be all that you died to make me. Take him out. Just write the name of that. We're going to pray. Fold it in half. Drop it on a ledge as you go. I'm going to make sure I collect all this. Father, help us. If we could do this, we would have done it on our own many times over. We need you. We're not big enough. We're not strong enough, but you are. So right now, I pray that you give us courage to even just write the name, to write it down, and to in that moment know that we are saying goodbye forever, and we're entrusting this battle to you. Help us right now to cut the cords on our heart that have actually made us affectionate toward these giants. Help us to be willing to hand this over to you and see what you will do with this as we invite you in. And we give you thanks for that. God, I pray in these next few weeks that we would begin to see the freedom and the blessing return to our lives that you've intended us to live in all along. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name.